Hey, it's JB and welcome to the channel. I'm really, really fortunate to have made a life in music, doing this thing I love. I've worn a lot of different hats. I've been a record producer, a songwriter, a session musician, a touring guitarist, a band member. I've been a film composer, a lot of different stuff. But the thing that gets me out of bed in the morning, the thing that motivates me, keeps me in this, is really just the artistry of it. The whole idea that you can bring into being something that's beautiful or maybe inspiring in some way in these nutty times that we live in. And I spent a lot of years trying to cultivate this artistic voice and find the courage to let it out. But easily the most epic undertaking I've ever attempted in this music life was the creation of this album that evolved over many, many years and iterations and in a lot of different places too, as you'll find out in a minute. It was my labor of love. It was the rocket ship I was building in the basement. You know, anytime I wasn't on somebody else's project, I was back in the pit tinkering with this thing. It seemed like it was never going to end. But fortunately, it did get done and I'm able to share this music with you along with the creative process and some of the stories around it. It's called Everywhere at Once and Here's how it sounds. So in my mid-30s, I took a much-needed break from the music industry. I had had a few run-ins with the darker side of the business, and I just needed a full detox. Uh, Carlos Santana had recently encouraged me strongly to work on my own music, and I took that really seriously. And I knew I didn't want to do it around a ton of other people that were trying to do the exact same thing, you know, in the shadow of the Hollywood sign. So my wife and I moved outside LA and that's when I started working on this. I needed to make music that was just strictly for personal expression, if not therapy. There was no consideration about the marketplace or commercial trends in music or any of that kind of stuff. And maybe because of that, there was a certain purity around the whole process. And there were some moments where the creative flow was so intense that I could only call it a spiritual experience. And those are the moments we all live for, right? It was really rewarding. And I was exploring really personal themes in the lyrics and stuff. It was definitely the most honest music I'd ever made up until that point. So from there, we made a huge move to Guanajuato, Mexico, where I had spent a lot of time when I was 17, 18 years old. And from there, we moved to Victoria, BC, and we spent a couple of years in Portland, Oregon, and then down into Panga Canyon, California. And then we moved all the way out to Tennessee, first in Chattanooga, and then in Nashville, and then finally back to LA. And we were raising our family during all these moves. There were great times, there were crazy times. All in all, it was a grand adventure. But this whole entire period, I would come back, you know, off and on and work on this music. So for this video, I want to focus on one song. It's the first track on the album. It's called the Trash Can Song. You can find it on Spotify and Apple Music and all the streaming services. It was the one that got the whole thing going. This was sort of the song that set the tone for the album, so I thought it'd be a great place to start. Okay, here goes. Okay. 
So this song actually doesn't have the words trash can in it at all. It started out in a whole other style. It was like a trip hop, moody, dark thing. And then one day I was playing around with samples of an actual trash can and making rhythms. And I realized that this song needs to go that direction and be this big, bright vibe with loud drums and acoustic guitars and stuff. And I was calling it the trash can song and the nickname just kind of stuck. So the lyrical theme of this is an older guy giving advice to a younger guy. The first line is just the young man's voice. Let's see. Why don't you tell me what you know? You've been around so long. He looked at me and said it. And you never hear the young man's voice again. The whole rest of the song is in the older guy's voice responding to him. And he, you know, he clearly has some regrets and he wants to be helpful, but he doesn't know if his message is going to be received, which is a good, uh, another good reason to use a trash can. I'd love to tell you something if I could take my own advice. So, and the chorus, he knows that his advice is basically just cliches. The whole chorus is just a list of cliches. And then he says on and on and on, like so on and so forth. Like, you're not going to listen to this anyway. I could take my own So that's what's going on with him. In the second verse, it evolves and he starts to talk about time going by really fast and all the kinds of things that young people don't understand. You know, they say youth is wasted on the young. So that's kind of where he's coming from. And I always think that the second verse of a song should get more personal and more kind of specific. I feel like it needs to offer something that the first verse didn't. You know, kind of like the difference between an establishing shot in a movie and the indoor shot where the stuff is actually happening. So that's verse two for me in songs in general. But it's interesting that the old man um, actually still does have some fire in him because in the bridge, he talks about how he still thinks he's going to make his mark, even if he basically, even if he dies trying. Bridges in songs. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of writing a bridge in a song, like a departure, where you feel like there's more places to go in the universe of that song. Or if it was a house, there would be like another room that you didn't know about, or a window that looks outside. So that's what a bridge is to me. Even if it's super short like this, I love a bridge. I wasn't sure which guy I was in this song, actually. I was still in my 30s. I didn't feel young and impressionable anymore, but I also didn't feel older and wiser. So in some ways, I was both guys or flip-flopping back and forth between the two. I often wonder what I would tell my younger self. I think most of my advice would be, no, you're not crazy. You know, your ideas are good and they're actually worth something. Full steam ahead, you know, <laughs> but get some therapy and take a business course. Actually, I'd love to hear in the comments section what your advice would be to your younger self. That would be really great to hear about. So production-wise, uh, a lot of how I express myself is in the texture and the quality of the, of the sounds. I really think a lot of the story is in the tones. So in this one, there's a lot of retro or nostalgic elements to try to capture that intergenerational conversation that's happening in the tune. And... Um, it's mostly little Beatle references and stuff like that. So I'll try to find them. But first, I just want to mention something about the, about the rhythms. So in addition to the trash can, there's these big Brazilian surdo bass drums that come in in the chorus.
and a guido playing. And then the mighty Paul Gonzalez comes in with live drums playing on a live kit. There's a little hip hop kick underneath it. It's cool. The, it's sort of, it, if you speed it up, it's basically James Brown, but it's, it kind of reminds me of the stuff the Dust Brothers did when they produced Beck. Kind of Beckish. Listen to this snare drum sound. I'll mute the percussion. It was this big crazy snare called the Mondo snare. I'll find a picture of it. But uh, it was perfect because it was ringing all over the place and it just was perfect with the surdos. Here, I'll put them back in. It's great working with guys that you've been hanging out with for 20 years because, well, maybe 10 years at that time. We sort of finish each other's musical sentences and Paul always brings that mix of orchestral perspective and creativity to everything he does. So I'm so, so grateful to have him on here. Now, the bass on this is me trying to play in the style of Paul McCartney in the verses and then switching to a big dub reggae kind of synth bass in the chorus. I didn't know how to play bass, really. I kind of taught myself how to play bass for this album because I was in Mexico for a lot of it. I just didn't have a bass player around. So I got this black Epiphone SG style bass and kind of like did what I could. But here's what that sounds like. Really playing up and down the neck on two strings for that McCartney thing. And then when it gets to the chorus, it's this this crazy synth bass, like I said. So it's it's a dub reggae style sound. I'll play it by itself. And then there's these little horns that are kind of reggae-ish also, and a reggae organ. And then when it gets to the bridge, I'm going to mute everything. Here's the bridge sounds. Mellotron flute and weird little bells. Sergeant Pepper. That's what it sounds like in this guy's head. Maybe he's still carrying the spirit of the 60s, you know? And that's what inspires him. And then, of course, it's time to go to the big guitar solo. Right? I mean, come on, whose record is this anyways? I get to do whatever I want. George Harrison, another Beatley reference here. Slide guitar, but melodic, not very bluesy, right? We'll see what it sounds like here. Let's see. Let's just solo it and see if it can handle that kind of scrutiny. It's got an octave pedal under it, like Prince had in When Doves Cry. And, um, you know, that tape flangey kind of uh, slightly psychedelic quality. I was playing through a Vox amp, too. You guitar nerds know. That's Beatle territory. And one cool thing, guitar nerd note, if you play slide in a non-open tuning, like in a standard tuning, you can hit a lot of these little, you can hit some of these little minor chords. You know, you can hit the... It's 
kind of nice to be able to do that. And it doesn't sound like the blues. So it opens up a different uh, part of the brain, kind of. So here's one nobody will ever hear or ever notice. But there's a breakdown chorus where all the beats go away here before the big ending. And the bass plays a reprise at the beginning. You got to do what you know is right. And Why you tell me what you know? Just sort of going back to the original question that the young man had at the beginning of the tune. And then from there on out, it's all, you know, just a big, huge chorus without a lot of fuss. Just a little bit more slide guitar. And the horns are back. There's that guitar. And then the song ends with this little nod to Peter Gabriel. That weird little flute is sort of sledgehammery. Peter Gabriel and his producer Daniel Lenoir and his engineer Chad Blake. They're like the holy trinity of patron saints that inspired me the whole time I was making this music. And uh, even though only one of those three has ever heard this album yet, he liked it. So, yay team. And that's the Trash Can song. Let me know if you like these deep dives into the makeup and background of these songs. It's a lot of fun to go back and revisit it. I'll be putting each one of the tunes up on streaming services as we go. So every time I make a video, I'll make sure that the next song is up on streaming. But if you want to check out the whole album, it is available. It's on my website, jbeckel.com, J-B-E-C-K-L.com. And it's also on Bandcamp. So I'll put both of those links in the description, of course. And I hope you do go and check out the whole record. But that's it for me. Hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next video. Onwards. I'd never believe it, I'd been told Everything takes so long Except for the 